Okay, I guess we can start uh, the book of Hebrews, The Glorious Jesus. This is lesson number eight in this series, and the title of this particular lesson, Jesus Greater Than the Jewish Religion, uh, and it'll be part one of this particular section. Uh, we're also going to be reading out of uh, Hebrews chapter eight. So if you want to follow along in your Bibles, you open them up to Hebrews chapter eight. So let's review our outline to see uh, where we are in our um, epistle here. Uh, last, uh, last lesson, we finished the section showing uh, Jesus' superiority as high priest uh, as compared to, to Aaron. Aaron was the high priest, the Old Testament, but uh, Jesus, of course, and the writer is comparing the two and he's demonstrating how Jesus is superior as a high priest. Um, and we said that, uh, of course, the book itself, uh, the book of Hebrews, uh, I've repeated it several times, is an effort by the writer to demonstrate to those uh, he is writing to uh, who are being tempted to return to Judaism, to abandon Christianity, go back to Judaism. He's demonstrating how Christianity, and Jesus in particular, is greater uh, than Judaism. Uh, and uh, specifically Jesus himself, greater than the angels, greater than Moses, greater than Aaron, greater than Aaron's uh, ministry. And then we said the second part of this book, chapters 10 to 13, uh, would be to demonstrate uh, the glorious church. And uh, he gives more information about the church. Okay, so we're in the section uh, where he is showing, uh, uh, demonstrating how Jesus is greater than, than Aaron. And uh, so he says that um, in doing this, he's comparing the two. So he says, well, Aaron and the descendants of Aaron, who, who, uh, who were high priests, uh, they were appointed by the law. Uh, they were temporary. I mean, they were human beings. You know, they died and eventually had to be replaced. Uh, they were sinful. They were people. And because they were people, they were sinful. And then alongside of this, he demonstrates that Jesus as a high priest is appointed not by the law, but he's appointed by God himself and appointed by God you know, through an oath. God makes an oath, imagine, uh, the highest type of calling. Also, he's not temporary, he's eternal uh, because he is the divine son of God. And um, it's interesting how the writer uh, demonstrates his eternal nature. He compares him to Melchizedek, this figure in the Old Testament who uh, received tithes and who gave a blessing to uh, Abraham. And um, he's basically saying Aaron is in the, excuse me, the high priests are in the mold of Aaron, the original high priest. Uh, Jesus, on the other hand, is in the mold of Melchizedek, this, this mysterious figure in the Old Testament. Um, uh, suggesting no beginning, no end, and so on and so forth. And of course, uh, as a high priest, Jesus is righteous. There's no sin uh, found in Him. So the point was that Jesus is better, therefore don't abandon the greater for the, for the lesser. That's always the argument that he's making throughout the book. This is what you have. Do not abandon this to go back to what you had in the past. It's not as good. Okay, so the final section in part one of this epistle, chapters eight, verse one to 10, verse 18, is going to deal with Jesus' ministry. In other words, the author reviews Jesus' work as a high priest and not just his credentials to be the high priest. And what he's going to say about that is the following. He's going to say, first of all, where Jesus works is superior. The sanctuary where Jesus does his ministry is superior than the sanctuary where Aaron did his work. Uh, he's going to tell us the authority by which Jesus works is also superior. He's going to compare the covenants. And he's also going to show that Jesus' work uh, itself is superior. In other words, what was the work of the priests? Well, they had to offer sacrifices. Well, he's going to demonstrate that Jesus' work, the offering of sacrifice, is superior than uh, the work of the uh, priests, uh, according to Aaron. So chapter eight serves as a, a, a bridge between the, the, the discussion on credentials and ministry as it introduces two key ideas that are going to be discussed. So 
uh, the first key idea, Jesus' ministry superior uh, to Aaron's ministry. So he's just demonstrated that Jesus is a more qualified high priest than Aaron. Now he's going to explain why Jesus' ministry is superior to Aaron's ministry. First of all, he says that Jesus ministers in a better place. And so we read verses one and two. It says, now the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched, not man. So note what he says, now the main point. All right, refers to what the author is about to say. This is the climax of what has come previously. This Jesus, once having offered His sacrifice, is not like earthly priests who continually offered sacrifice, who did so in a man-made place, the tabernacle in the desert or the temple in Jerusalem, who have no rest. You know, once they've offered one sacrifice one day, they've got to do it again the next day and the next day and the next day and so on and so forth. So he says, this Jesus sits. When he talks about sitting, that denotes authority or completeness. You sit after your work is done. So he sits at the right hand of God, denoting the position of power. And he is the minister, meaning he's the priest that serves the true, meaning the real or the eternal sanctuary where God lives, which is in heaven. The true sanctuary is not on earth. The sanctuary on earth is simply a reflection, it's a shadow of the real thing. The real thing is in heaven. And the author is saying, Jesus serves his ministry not in the shadow, he serves it in the real thing, the real place, which is in heaven. So the conclusion is, the place that he ministers is superior. So let's keep going, verse three, he says, for every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, so it is necessary that this high priest also have something to offer. So he introduces or he reintroduces the idea of Jesus' sacrifice, meaning the thing that he offers, but he doesn't develop the thought of it quite yet. He merely states the fact that just like the Levitical priests had sacrifices to work with in their daily ritual offerings, Jesus also, as a priest, has to have a sacrifice to offer. If you're a priest, you've got to have something to offer. All right? So he's already said that Jesus' sacrifice was himself, but he's merely preparing his audience for another discussion on this point a little later on. So you know, take the point, keep it in mind, we're going to go back to it in a moment. So let's read verses four and five. He says, now if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle, for see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. So the point here, however, is that the Levitical priests offered their sacrifices in an earthly setting given to them by Moses according to God's plan and design. If you read the Old Testament, boy, the tabernacle in the desert uh, was very complex. There's chapter after chapter after chapter of information, you know, how wide, how tall the materials the rings, the, the poles, everything, you know, all the specs, if you wish, engineering term, all the specs were there and they had to follow that thing exactly, right? So he's saying the tabernacle in the desert was only a copy of the true and eternal sanctuary that already existed in heaven. And he's saying Moses had to be careful to follow exactly the instructions in constructing that particular tabernacle. So let's talk about that tabernacle for a moment. Uh, the tabernacle had two compartments and very few furnishings. It was where the priests did their work in offering sacrifices. While they were in the desert, uh, it was assembled and disassembled in the middle of the camp by the Levites 
and the Israelites camped around it. The tribes camped around the tabernacle. Uh, and when it was time to go, the Levites would go in, they'd disassemble it and so on and so forth, and they'd march out and you know, one tribe after another would march with them. And then when they got to another place, they stopped. The Levites would re not reconstruct, but reassemble the tabernacle and the tribes would take their position. Same positions always around the uh, tabernacle. Uh, God's presence was marked by a pillar of smoke in the day and a pillar of fire at night. Um, its construction and furnishings were designed by God and it was the model for the temple that would later be built by Solomon uh, in Jerusalem. Um, uh, another, um, um, uh, excuse me, not another, but the author is showing his readers the difference between where the ministry of the old high priest took place and where the ministry of the new high priest takes place. They, imperfect, temporal, they served in a copy or shadow of the true sanctuary where Christ, the righteous and eternal high priest, serves uh, in heaven. And yet we know that the earthly sanctuary was something to behold. I mean, it was amazing, just the, 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 uh, the tabernacle in the desert. And of course, the temple that Solomon built, it was you know, sumptuous, gold, and you know, just a magnificent, nothing like it. And yet, this was simply a shadow, simply a reflection of the true tabernacle, the true sanctuary, which is in the spiritual realm. So that's the first thing he says. He serves the high priest, Jesus as a high priest, he serves in a better place than you know, Aaron the high priest. Then he says, Jesus ministers according to a better covenant. There's another difference. Now the author adds another argument to his presentation of the idea that Jesus' ministry is superior to Aaron's. Not only does Jesus' ministry uh, take place in a better place, as I mentioned, but he does so by the authority of a better covenant which he mediates. So we got two words here that we need to look at examine. Um, if, um, the first word is covenant. The word means agreement, but God's covenant with men were promises which He bound Himself to keep. Uh, I hear people sometimes talk about covenants as contracts, you know, and they describe them as contracts, like business contracts, contracts, but this is not so, this is not ac uh, accurate, because in a business contract, a contract is negotiated by two parties with each party contributing ideas and requests and demands and so on and so forth, and we kind of negotiate till we all agree. That's, that's a human contract. Uh, and then it was ratified by some sort of agreement once everyone was satisfied, a seal, a handshake, something, okay? God has used covenants or promises to progressively reveal His ultimate plan of saving man and granting His eternal and blissful life with Him in heaven. And the way that He's kind of, by piecemeal, revealed this plan, one of the ways, is by the covenants that He's made with man over time. And so because of sin, men are slow to understand God's will and God's way, and so God reveals slowly what He was doing through a series of promises and covenants. And let me just give you uh, these things very briefly. For example, there's the, uh, yes, we talked about a covenant. There's the covenant with Noah. What was the covenant or the promise? You, know, you can switch these two words, covenant or promise. What was, the, what was the promise to Noah? Well, it was not to destroy the earth again with a flood and to guarantee the seasons despite man's failures. That was a covenant. I promise you, he said, I promise you, the earth will not be destroyed again by a great flood. And you know, imagine the men, the people living in those times, you know, without that promise. Every time the rain started to fall, they might have wondered, uh-oh, <laughs> is is, are we going to have another flood? Are we going to be wiped out again? No, because there was a promise that this would not happen again, that the earth would survive. Today we're thinking, well, yeah, sure, you know, we get the harvest, the sun comes up, 
but having gone through such a cataclysmic uh, experience, Noah and his family and their descendants needed the assurance that spring would be followed by summer and seed time and harvest and so on and so forth. They needed the assurance to keep going. Okay. So there was one covenant. Then there was the covenant with Abraham or the promise. What was the promise to Abraham? Well, it was to give him a special land and a land and, a, and, and descendants through which the world would be, would be blessed. That was the promise with Abraham. Uh, Moses, there was a covenant or a promise with Moses and that was to make the Jews his special people and to bless them in particular. So Noah's covenant is in Genesis 9, 9 to 17. Abraham we see in Genesis 17, 1 to 8. Moses, Exodus chapter 6, verse 7. All right. So these covenants had special features that made them different than what we refer to as contracts. Okay? So here are some of the differences. First of all, God is the one that conceived the promise or the covenant and established all of the details within the covenant, not man. Man had no input into the covenant. Unlike a human contract with both parties you know, contributing, with a covenant with God, only God put in the conditions. Man either accepted or refused, but he had no input other than that. Another feature is the covenant included all to whom it spoke. In other words, Noah's covenant spoke to the whole human race. Uh, Abraham's covenant spoke to all of Abraham's descendants. Uh, the Mosaic covenant was for the Jewish nation, not for the Gentiles. And then thirdly, so uh, uh, it was conceived and all the details by God, uh, it included everyone to whom it spoke. And thirdly, a covenant could not be changed by man. Man could, by his choosing, not benefit from the covenant, but he couldn't change the terms or prevent it from being fulfilled. So he could, you know, man could choose to drown himself, you know, Noah's covenant, or could refuse to be circumcised in Abraham's covenant, refuse the circumcision not to be part of the covenant, or disobey God's laws and separate himself from the nation of Israel during Moses' covenant. Man had the freedom to do those things. So the author is saying here that God has made a new covenant. Here's the point I'm getting to. God has made a new covenant, a new promise with man, and this new covenant has better conditions which reveal His final purpose for man. The other covenants were designed to prepare man for this covenant. There's the importance of why should we know something about the previous covenants, okay? And so this new covenant had another mediator, not Noah, not Abraham, not Moses. The mediator of this covenant was Jesus Christ. And so the basic rejection, you know, I, I make an aside here, a, a parenthetical statement. The basic rejection of the religion of Islam, you know, if you're kind of debating this thing, you know, where do you start? I'll tell you where you start. You start at the covenant. You start at the covenant with the idea that God has not made a new covenant with Muhammad as the mediator. That's the argument. I mean, if you want to boil it all down to one thing, what's the difference? You know, what's the difference between Islam and Well, they're not allowed to eat pork and we can eat pork if we want and they pray five times a day. That's not the difference. I mean, those are superficial differences. The real difference is uh, uh, with whom has God made a covenant? Did He make an additional covenant after Jesus with this man, Muhammad? We say no. Why? Because the Bible tells us that the last covenant, and we'll see, is made with Jesus, period. There's no covenant after, after this, okay? So that's usually the, uh, you know, if you want to start with a debate or start with a discussion, that's usually where you should start. Who did God make a covenant with? All right, so we said uh, these are the covenants, right? The different covenants. Let's talk about a mediator, this other word mediator. A mediator um, you know, is a familiar word to the readers here. 
It meant an arbitrator, someone to help bring two parties together, one who stood in the middle. Jesus is the ideal representative for both parties, for God and for man, and not only reveals it to man, but fulfills all of the conditions of the covenant, both for God and man, as the mediator, Jesus. He does everything. So he offers himself as a perfect sacrifice on behalf of mankind to God, and he also gives man the Holy Spirit on behalf of God. So he offers up to God his life on behalf of man, and then he gives man the Spirit on behalf of God. And this is the way he's the mediator of the covenant, and he takes both, you know, both positions, if you wish. All right, so now that we understand those terms, let's read uh, verse six here. It says, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant which has been enacted on better promises. Okay, makes a little more sense now. So the author is saying Jesus' ministry is better because the covenant upon which it is based is better. That's what summarizes the argument. This new covenant is better and thus has been enacted, in other words, put into operation because it's based on better promises, ones which will reveal the final fulfillment of the purpose of God. Listen, no other religion offers better promises than Christianity. I mean, I'll debate that with anybody, anytime, anywhere. No other religion offers what Christianity offers. If you're just looking at you know, this religion versus that one versus, versus this one, as a matter of fact, and I've mentioned this to you before, all other religions, first of all, all religions deal with the condition of man, okay? How does man get better? How does, you know, how does man reach nirvana, heaven, paradise, whatever? All religions you know, discuss this problem. And all religions, the solution that all, every other religion, except Christianity, the solution that every other religion offers man is the law. Always the law. Keep this, do that, sacrifice this, this, give this, Obey that, blah, blah, blah. If you, if you do right, if you do something, uh, then you'll be acceptable to God. Christianity is the only religion whereby an individual is made right by God through faith. The only religion. And the only religion that offers an individual to be perfected in the eyes of God and remain conscious of who he is in the spiritual dimension. Most of the Eastern religions, the individual is simply you know, kind of absorbed up into the great whatever. Um, um, Islam uh, promises a conscious paradise, but the paradise that they're talking about is like super earth, you know? Good food, many virgins for men. You, know? you notice that the women don't get anything like, like, like that <laughs> in, in Islam. And so Islam promises the best of this world frozen in time forever. Christianity takes us out of this dimension altogether and brings us into another dimension where God and man can dwell. As a matter of fact, the dimension that God actually creates in order to enable us to exist with Him. Because right now there is no dimension where we can exist with Him. You know, the new heavens, the new earth, that's the dimension where we can go and be with God. All right, so I'm, I'm a little far afield here, but uh, the, all of this takes place because Jesus has mediated this, this new contract, this new covenant uh, for us. Okay, so let's keep reading verse seven. He says, for if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. In other words, he confirms his statement by pointing to a self-evident fact. There would be no need for a new covenant if the old covenant had succeeded. Succeeded in what? Well, succeeded in making individuals righteous. They knew it hadn't, and so you know, they, they couldn't argue with his reasoning. It didn't mean that God failed. It just meant that his intentions were not complete with the old covenant. We're not knocking the Old Covenant. We're not denigrating God's law in the Old Testament, no. 
We're just saying that was not yet the, fulfill, the, the complete fulfillment of His purpose for mankind. That's all. Verse eight and nine. He says, for finding fault with them, he says, and now he's going to quote here, Jeremiah. He says, behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers, the old covenant, on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. So he quotes Jeremiah 31, 31, an Old Testament prophet, to show that even six centuries before Jesus, the setting aside of the covenant with the Jews would be necessary. Not because God could not fulfill its promises to bless them, but because they could not live within the conditions of the covenant given to them by God. So he's saying to them, look, you people, you want to live in the old covenant? You want to go back to Judaism? Meaning you want to go back to that old covenant? Your ancestors couldn't live under that old covenant. And Jeremiah the prophet, six centuries ago, you know, articulated the idea that you could not live under this covenant. You couldn't obey the law perfectly. And so the prophet says that a, a, a new covenant would be necessary. A new covenant would be given. So the writer is saying, hey, this is not an idea we just made up here. This idea of the new covenant, this is not something Christianity imagined. He goes all the way back to Jeremiah, six centuries before them, for us, 16 centuries, but he goes back six and he says, Jeremiah said it himself to the Jews. You people cannot succeed under this covenant. There will be, uh, it'll be necessary to create a new covenant. And so the Hebrew writer is saying, what, what I'm talking to you about is what the prophets uh, prophesied. What's happening here with Jesus is that new covenant he was talking about, it's here. And Jesus is the mediator of it. So a different type of covenant was necessary and the author of Hebrews is saying that this covenant has now been enacted by Jesus Christ. Now for us, you know, again, this is the study of Hebrews, it's a little complicated, you know, hmm. But if you were a Jew in the first century, this proof text was absolutely important for you to understand in order to continue on in your Christian faith. You know, as North Americans, if we're not believers or if we, you know, we're non-Christians, we, you know, we have a little smack of Christianity behind us and we start uh, you know, studying the Bible, you know, whether the Old Covenant or New Covenant is effective, that's not usually a question. I mean, in, in 37 years of ministry, I don't think a single person has ever asked me that question when I studied the Bible with them. Oh yeah, am I still under the Old Covenant? Is the Old Covenant still important for me? No. People don't ask that question, but if you were a Jew, it was important. And so he now talks about the, the conditions of this new covenant. So in the final section, we can see from the passage that the author has quoted from Jeremiah the nature of this new covenant that was to come. Three features. First of all, the new covenant is inward and spiritual. That's in verse 10, he says. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds and I will write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So the Old Testament had the externals of ritual and God's commandments and His will, you know, and these things were written on stone for everyone to see and to learn and to be measured by. Because what was the purpose of the law? You know, the commandments and everything. What was the purpose of the law? Well, the purpose of the law wasn't to make you a better person. Fortunately, so many people even today think the commandments are there to help them become a better person. No. The purpose of the law was to demonstrate that you were a sinner. That was the purpose of, of the law. In the Old Testament, all the rituals of the temple and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the, the tabernacle, the rituals were there to show the people that they were not worthy to come before God. 
they were reminded over and over and over again that they're not worthy. And the law showed them why they were not worthy, by exposing sinfulness. So the new covenant, in this new covenant, men would know God's laws, they would have the willingness and the hunger and the thirst to do His will because they would have a sense of Him from within, not just outwardly through religious rites, but inwardly through intimate knowledge of God. How? Oh. You know in Acts chapter 2, 37, 38, where Peter is preaching the gospel on Pentecost Sunday, and they say, men and brethren, what should we do? And he says, repent every one of you and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your, sin, for the forgiveness of your sins. And what does he say after? And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Boy, that was the big news. Everybody knew baptism was connected to you know, sin, you know, washing away sin. Jews knew that, that was a familiar idea. The new idea was the Spirit will be inside of you. <gasps> oh. That was the promise of the prophets in the Old Testament, that God's Spirit would be inside of you, not just for a time, not just certain special people like kings or judges or prophets. They had the Spirit for a time. They spoke through the Spirit for a time. They served God for a time through the power of the Spirit. But not everybody had the Spirit, just a few and only a little while. The promise of the Old Testament you know, for this new covenant, the day is going to come when the Spirit of God is going to be in everybody, male, female, slave, free, everybody's going to have the Spirit of God. From the king down to the slave, everybody's going to have the Spirit within him. Now that's a better covenant, isn't it? That's a much better deal. So what Jesus referred to as being you know, born again you know, in John 3, verses three to six, Paul elaborates this idea in Romans 7, 6, this inward transformation being accomplished by the word of God as revealed by Christ and the transforming power of the Holy Spirit given to us in baptism. Here's the difference. The law cannot make me want to do right. It can only tell me what will happen if I do wrong. But the word of God and the spirit of God within me, it creates in me the desire to do what is right. That's the difference. That's the new condition in the new covenant. Also, another difference, he says, it's not only inward and spiritual, it's also personal and universal. Verse 11, he says, and they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother saying, know the Lord, for all will know me from the least to the greatest of them. Before only the scribes and rulers would teach and they were the experts and with them resided the knowledge of God. In the new covenant, divine matters would not be the private possession of a particular class priests, Levites, scribes, Pharisees. With the new covenant, the promise was made that the world, excuse me, that these things would be personal and intimate, that the knowledge of God would be personal and intimate, and that everybody, rich, poor, educated or not, would have access to the knowledge of God, not just His law, but God Himself. Not just what he said, but he himself will be known. That's the promise. Isn't that a better deal? The old covenant says, okay, we're going to reveal to you what God says, 10 commandments, the priests, the law, the rituals, and all that stuff. In the new covenant, it says, we're not going to reveal to you what God says. We're going to reveal to you who God is. Yeah. I mean, what, 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 what would you rather have, a picture of your wife or your wife in person? You know, which would you rather have? I mean, I, I mean there may be some jokes there. You know, I see some snickering going on, but <laughs> theoretically, right? All right, verse 12. He says another feature, 
the new covenant will deal effectively with sin. Inward and spiritual, personal, universal, deals effectively with sin. Uh, chapter eight, verse 12, he says, for I will be merciful to their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. Remember I said, the priest is offering the sacrifice and what's the purpose of that? To keep reminding people that they're sinners every single day, seven days a week, every year in, year out, sacrifice after sacrifice to remind you you're a sinner. But in the new covenant, the writer says, one of the features of it is once God forgives you, you're done. He doesn't remember your sins anymore. They're gone from His sight. So in the old covenant, there was sacrifice in order to remind people of sin. The conscience, the conscience could never be clear. In the new covenant, there is a forgetting of sin made possible by Christ's one for all sacrifice, thus freeing the conscience and purifying the heart. I might remember that bad thing that I did 25 years ago. I might remember that, but God has put that thing away from Him so that He does not see it. And I believe in this, now I'm speculating here, I believe one of the features of heaven, of our heavenly existence will be that I also will not remember those sins anymore. I will no longer define myself by my failure. That's, I believe, one of the great features of heaven. So we will see later that this forgiveness, later in this epistle, by the way, we will see later that this forgiveness of sins is the basis upon which all the blessings and promises that he makes are based. Verse 13, he says, when he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete, but whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. So he refers back to Jeremiah's statement, you know, 600 years before Christ, in referring to the new covenant that he would eventually make. The point is that the writing was already on the wall for the covenant centuries before. So to say it is over is not to say too much in light of the fact that Jeremiah said that this would happen. Again, the writer is saying to his readers, this is nothing new, folks. I'm not, I'm not talking to you about a brand new idea that nobody ever heard of. Go back and read Jeremiah. He said 600 years ago that the old covenant you know, was on its way out. I'm just here to tell you that time is now. So little by little, the old covenant was disappearing and with the arrival of Jesus, the appearance of the new covenant became obvious. So the author shows that Jesus as high priest has a better ministry than Aaron for two reasons. First of all, he ministers in a better place, the true sanctuary which is heaven. And secondly, he ministers according to a better covenant or according to a better set of promises which has new features. For example, the new covenant has inward and spiritual features. In other words, the individual heart would be changed. Secondly, it was personal and universal. Every person would have access. In the Old Testament, just the Jews. New Testament, new covenant, everyone has access. And thirdly, this covenant deals effectively with sin. Not a covenant to help remember sin, but a covenant to free us from the guilt of sin forever. So the lesson for us today and every generation is that those who receive forgiveness of sins and all have access to this through Christ, these people will be changed. They'll be born again. They'll be new creatures. How? From the inside out. From the inside out. So we need not you know, be discouraged when this doesn't happen all at once or it's not a steady thing. We have highs and lows. We need to remember that the change in us, um, in Christ, is based on God's covenant, not our ability or our, uh, or our willpower. I repeat that again. The change in us in Christ is based on God's covenant. In other words, 
He has promised to change us from the inside out. And so we say, well, what is my job? My job is to submit to the Spirit. Let Him work. Stop fighting Him. You know, when your conscience says, do this, then do it. If, you're, if your heart says, don't do that, then don't do it. You know, if the Spirit is moving you to take a step in a certain direction in ministry, stop fighting Him. Just do it. So long as we remain within the covenant by trust and obedience to Christ, God will change our hearts and He will come closer in union with us and keep our consciences clear and ready for judgment day. These are the conditions that He's made and promised to fulfill in His covenant with us. Remember, He's in charge of the covenant, not us. All right, so that's that section of Hebrews. A lot to take in all at once, uh, but I think this is a most satisfying book, uh, certainly um, really treats the heart and soul of the gospel in a very spiritual way.